Greece is back in the news again. Well, admittedly a few weeks ago. And, but still, I think this is significant because there was a time, specifically from about 2010 until 2016, 17, somewhere like that, uh, that Greece was never out of the news. But it has started making the news again. Following the pandemic, the government of Mitsotakis enacted some labour reform laws, which the veteran trade unionist uh, Grigoris Kalomiris, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, referred to as Thatcherite policies on steroids. But a more recent article uh, in The Guardian, written by Helena Smith, discusses Mitsotakis' uh, more recent measure of a six-day work week. So why is Mitsotakis going along this um, neoliberal path, which is clearly controversial in Greece? Well, the key point here, which is mentioned in the article, that according to Mitsotakis himself, Greece is facing the problem of a shrinking population and a shortage of skilled workers, which Mitsotakis described as a ticking time bomb. The article's author, Helena Smith, reminds us that during the near decade-long um, debt crisis, about 500,000 Greeks emigrated. It's important to remember that Greece was at the epicenter of the 2008 financial crisis. Now, I vividly remember the predominantly neoliberal media narrative at the time, which portrayed the Greeks as profligate, happy to borrow endless amounts of money from the hardworking, parsimonious uh, Germans and the French, and as a result that they were able to live their best lives with a booming economy. Then, as credit, which had been uh, rapidly drying up since 2007, 2008, in 2010, the Greek state was bankrupt and needed a bailout to avoid a catastrophic default. So here we were introduced to the heroes of the story, which were the generous Northern Europeans, specifically the hardworking Germans, who saved the Greek state, which otherwise would have gone bust. And all the Germans asked for in return, or all the financiers asked for in return for financial salvation, was a little bit of belt-tightening austerity. Now, I want to make it clear that this story that I described, which was the story that was put out there largely by the neoliberal press, and okay, I've dramatized it, um, was one masterclass of self-serving propaganda. To understand what led to this crisis, it really is important to understand the underlying ideological driving force behind this uh, crisis, or behind the years that preceded the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent debt crisis in, Greek, in Greece and other European periphery states such as Ireland and Spain, etc. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, uh, known as the Thatcher and Reagan, uh, Reagan years, the old Keynesian economic thinking, which was the theoretical blueprint for capitalism throughout the post-1945 era, was being replaced by the ideas of Friedrich von Hayek and Milton Friedman. Uh, this became known as um, neoliberal economics. This culminated in the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act uh, during Clinton's term. Now, this effectively removed all key regulatory rules. In the absence of rules that regulated their behavior, banks basically created all sorts of complex financial products that were designed to de-risk extremely risky behavior. They went on a lending frenzy, not only to each other, but basically to anyone and everyone that was willing to borrow for them. In a very short space of time, their asset books exploded in value, profits skyrocketed, and the lessons of the 2000, sorry, the lessons of the 1929 
Wall Street crash were memory hold. This behavior was replicated by French and German banks, uh, which themselves went on a frenzy lending spree. They targeted primarily uh, Southern European states, Portugal, Spain, Greece, but also Ireland as well. Uh, the states between them, particularly Greece, uh, had relatively low levels of public indebtedness and plenty of collateral, which bankers love. This was also combined with the profit possibilities of being able to lend to a European periphery nation like Greece at a higher level of interest than, say, a German customer. All in a currency which could not be devalued, like the Greek drachma or the Irish punt could have been uh, devalued. So why was the risk to financial stability ignored? Well, largely again due to the ideology of neoliberalism, which believes that individuals are calculating rational creatures who, when freely permitted to engage economically with each other, do so in the most efficient manner. The most efficient, the most economically brilliant, rise to the top, and those who are more error-prone are eliminated from the market. So when we aggregate this behavior collectively, we are left with a stable, self-enforcing equilibrium. Therefore, according to this theory, and specific to this example, if we allow self-interested economic actors to basically do their thing, like the world's largest financial institutions were doing their thing, uh, then they will make optimal decisions, both for themselves, for their companies, and in doing so will improve the collective welfare for everyone. In other words, and you could say by definition, the world's largest financial institutions and banks were really smart, brilliant economic superheroes. And any rules enforced on them by the highly inefficient state, such as, for example, the Glass-Steagall Act, was basically inhibiting growth, inhibiting progress, and was a bad thing. This economic ideology of neoliberalism, of Friedrich von Hayek, of Milton Friedman, which became the dominant theory of capitalism in the latter half of the 20th century, couldn't recognize risk because if, I mean, if the bank's asset books had exploded in value by orders of magnitude, uh, this was absolutely nothing to worry about. It most definitely wasn't an asset bubble brought about by short-term frenzy profit gouging that was at risk of exploding at any moment. It didn't raise any alarm bells because it wasn't theoretically possible for it to do so. And as for the peripheral European nations at the time, this policy made a lot of sense. Your, the peripheral nations were being flooded full of cash. Uh, I can't speak for Greece, but I do remember in Ireland at the time, uh, it was known as the Celtic Tiger. Ireland was governed by Fianna Foyle. I very, very well remember um, Bertie Ahern and later Brian Cowan. They won countless elections during that time easily. Uh, and the lead opposition uh, party at the time, Fine Gael, which was led by Enda Kenny, the only complaint from him at the time was that the government wasn't going far enough, that there needed to be more money, more cash, more boom, more building, more construction, less restraint. Around 2007, people basically started sobering up. Financiers began to get nervous, banks stopped lending to each other, and credit dried up. The scale of the crisis was becoming apparent throughout 2008. Uh, suddenly, banks found that their asset, their asset books had lost catastrophic value. And with further lending brought to a swift halt, the banks were effectively insolvent or bankrupt. Uh, the Bundestag at that time, the German parliament, had set aside 500 billion euros to save German banks. And of course, similar action was taken in France as politicians were warned of the cataclysmic consequences of not bailing out the French and German financial systems. 
But this was only to cover the losses of the junk US trades. What was to come in 2010 was unlike anything the European financial systems had ever seen. In early 2010, the French and German banks were owed something like 200 billion by Greece. And the total exposure in 2009 of German banks in particular to peripheral European nations added up to, I think it was 704 billion euros. So basically the risk of contagion, had Greece declared bankruptcy, would have taken down the German and French financial system with it. So in other words, it became imperative for, uh, at least for the German and the French financial systems, for Greece to be saved. Naturally enough, the Germans weren't very keen on this idea, so solidarity came with austerity. States like Greece now had to shrink their national incomes by enormous amounts to repay their debts. This meant, in real terms for the Greeks, massive reductions in pensions, public services and public salaries. Why? Well, again, it's important because the actual financiers and bankers that caused this mess were not prepared to accept the blame themselves. So it was necessary to redirect German public anger towards the Greek people, some of which, like some Irish people, like some Spanish people, like some Portuguese people, obviously did uh, benefit from all those years of frenzied lending, the vast majority of which did not, and that is a key point. The ECB, the IMF, and the European Commission, known collectively as the Troika, uh, the policies they pursued effectively plunged these peripheral European states into very long and very protracted recessions, particularly Greece. So what did we learn from the 2008 financial crisis and indeed the Troika's response was that, well, basically, whatever the cost was going to be, neoliberalism was going to be protected. And if the ideology was going to be protected, this basically means that it's very likely this type of mess would happen, could happen again. However, if it were to happen again, the results could be a lot more devastating than they were uh, back in 2008, especially for a country like Greece, which, have, as we have seen, has never really recovered insofar as its population and is facing a serious crisis, uh, a serious long-term crisis. For example, in the years leading up to the 2008 crash, the EU was going through an economic surge, uh, albeit on borrowed credit. But it, along with the United States, stood firmly at the center of global economic power. And in the case of the United States, of course, military power. There was a strong sense of optimism in 2005, 6, 7, etc. I, I remember it very, very well. Germany was an industrial powerhouse, completely awash with, with money. Contrast that with the situation in the EU today. Right now, Europe is experiencing a cost of living crisis. Germany is deindustrializing and is teetering on a recession. Growth across the EU is pretty much non-existent. And EU citizens have already been through a devastating financial crisis and the effects of the lockdown policies, for which many people in both cases haven't recovered. In short, the EU is simply not prepared for another 2008-style financial cr uh, crash. For example, in an article from Philip Inman uh, in The Guardian back in March of this year, he makes the point that, and here I'm quoting directly, the US economy zips ahead on fantastical stock market valuations and off-balance sheet accounting reminiscent of the years before the 2008 financial crisis and how both these habits could bite back in a big way much as they did in 2008 and pretty soon without any real meaningful change in economic thinking. The risks simply of another financial crisis are very high and we have a European population that's even, that is in an even worse position 
to deal with it, should it happen. Mitsotakis talks about a ticking time bomb facing Greece. Well, I'm curious to know uh, what would Mitsotakis' solution be to another devastating financial crisis like the one that Greece suffered from before. He's already acting a six-day work week, maybe a seven-day work week, maybe extending the working day to 20 hours. Who knows? But I would suggest that this is the real ticking time bomb that Mitsutakis should be concerned about. Well, thank you for watching the video. Um, of course, if you liked the video, please remember to tick the like button, subscribe. It's always fantastic when people do that. And... See you guys soon.